Well, thank you for uh, having Cal Can here, having me here, and, and for including uh, agriculture in your, um, in your, on your topic list. And, and special thanks to Linda Rudolph for making the connection for us. Um, hoping a PowerPoint presentation will come up here shortly. Um, there it is. Uh, I'm with the California Climate and Agriculture Network, and we are a, um, let's see, what's the button to push here? It should be a right arrow. I have just a star. I don't have a forward. Where's that green one? Oh, the big green arrow the big green arrow. pointing that way, yeah. <laughs> late in the day. Um, so we're a coalition of sustainable and organic agriculture organizations and we work very closely with farmers and ranchers, uh, scientists that study climate change and agriculture, um, NGOs, ag professionals, and, and policy makers. Um, I'm just going to start by talking about the, pr the, the problem, the challenge, um, the challenges in agriculture and the impacts of climate change on agriculture uh, without going into a lot of detail. Um, we have a about 7% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions are attributed to on-farm emissions. Uh, this doesn't include the up and downstream impacts of food production um, or the, the synthetic fertilizers or inputs that come in, you know, in onto the farm. This is just on the farm. So you can see from that pie chart how that breaks down. Um, we have, a, in parts of the state, a very significant groundwater contamination problem from the use of um, nitrogen as a, a, um, as a fertilizer. Both synthetic and organic fertilizers contribute to that. And then, especially in the Central Valley, <clears throat> we have quite of a unique um, conditions that create significant air quality problems. These are sort of geoclimatic uh, um, this, the, the, the geology and the, and the air um, currents and so on con conspire to create this very challenging environment that agriculture um, contributes to that have all kinds of health impacts. Um, there's a, a number of other, a litany of other challenges um, that are related to agriculture like soil salination and, and water scarcity and so on. And we're losing f farmland at, a, at an alarming rate. Um, in terms of the impacts of climate change on agriculture, uh, that sector is arguably um, the, on the front lines, um, being dependent as it is on natural resources and water. So these are, this is a laundry list of some of the major impacts, especially in California, on, on crop production and yields. Um, everything from the extreme and unpredictable weather patterns, um, the drought that we just came out of, uh, followed by possibly the wettest, record, uh, wettest year on record. We can anticipate some significant, and already have seen some significant flooding this winter. And as the as the winters warm and the snowpack uh, melts faster, we, we expect to see greater challenges there. Um, you can see there the the acreage that was fallowed in 2015 at the tail end of that four or five year drought, and the economic impacts of that. Um, unique to agriculture, we um, are especially hitting agriculture. There are uh, impacts from chill hours. Chill hours are the number of, of degree days below a certain temperature that, a, that fruit and, some fruit and nut trees need in order to properly bear fruit, bear, bear flowers and, and subsequently fruit. And this is um, starting to hit some of the crops in California in a very significant way. And then subsidence, the overdrawing of our groundwater table is leading to, to land actually sinking um, up to two inches a month in parts of the Central Valley. It's just astounding and the impacts on the infrastructure there are, um, you can imagine how, how challenging that is, as well as the, the impacts from heat stress on livestock and farm workers. Um, and all of these have economic and, um, and jobs impacts. So moving on to the good news, California's governor and legislature have adopted a very ambitious um, set of policies, and I'm going to whiz through them really, really fast to tell the story of agriculture's role in there. Uh, this is the, these are the pillars that Governor Brown has laid out for how to uh, tackle our um, greenhouse gas reduction targets, which are significant. You can see it there, 40% below 1990 levels by the year 2030. That just passed in August, that new, new target. And these two sectors here are where agriculture comes into the story. Um, in 20, 2006, um, AB 32 was passed, and it set our first target, which was to get to 1990 levels be, uh, t t by the year 2020. Um, SB 32 just passed, and that's what extended the target to 2030. 
Um, AB, th AB 32 included a cap and trade program, which is a key economic driver, um, a funding mechanism, importantly, for a lot of voluntary practices across the state and across the sectors um, and in many, many communities for achieving additional greenhouse gases uh, on top of the regulation of those biggest emitters of greenhouse gases. Um, <clears throat> the uh, cap and trade program, as it has been designed in California somewhat uniquely, includes a, um, a, a, an auction of permits to continue emitting greenhouse gas emissions that um, are under democratic control that basically are um, at the discretion of the governor and the legislature every year about how to fund what voluntary activities they go into what's called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. To date, there's been approximately $3 billion allocated to a whole bunch of activities, primarily in the what I call the built environment, transportation, housing, a little bit, um, quite a bit actually, in forest um, restoration and protection. There's another $2.2 .2 billion that the, the governor proposes budgeting for the coming fiscal year. So this is a significant amount of money in a state that was not so long ago in debt. Um, so I'm going to talk about the four programs in agriculture that have been established, um, just to give you a sense of both the, the policy leadership and the um, multiple benefits that these programs should be able to achieve as they mature. Um, they're laid out for you there and um, along with their funding um, levels. You can see that the funding is increasing uh, steadily in 2016-17. We don't have a final tar uh, total because the, the first program there, the, the land conservation program has not yet been budgeted, but it'll probably be about 110 or so million dollars this, this year. So I'm going to run through each of these programs very, very quickly, and I'm sorry about the darkness on that slide. Um, this is this, um, the Sustainable Ag, Ag Lands Conservation Program. This program um, allocates grants for the per permanent protection of farmland at risk of development. So it's a, a sister program to an affordable housing um, and, and, and infill smart growth development program. It's um, a very unique pairing um, of these two approaches to land use planning. There's been $42.5 million so far allocated for those easements on farmland that keep them in, in production. Um, the budget for the coming year is, as I said, is unclear, but probably $30 million or so. Um, it's been shown that the, the, the uh, one acre of, of, agri of urban land emits 70 times more greenhouse gas emissions than uh, one acre of irrigated cropland. So this is the scientific underpinnings for this program. Um, and the second program is the State Water uh, Efficiency and Enhancement Program. This has given gr direct payments to farmers for, in the form of grants, competitive grants, for reducing their water and energy use. They have to do both. All of these cap-and-trade programs must reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's a requirement of the law. Um, uh, but this program operates by reducing water, which of course requires energy to pump it. Um, and so far, um, about 67, 68 uh, million dollars has been allocated to, um, to those grants and over 500 different farms or different projects um, around the state have benefited from that. There are some um, obvious, I, I didn't mention the health impacts of the Sustainable Ag Lands Conservation Program, but they, I keep bumping into these, uh, I, have, I have Italian arms, I'm not even Italian, <laughs> but. Um, I, I wave around a lot. Um, the, I want to go back to this, the, the SALK program for a second and just talk about the health impacts. The, uh, the development of um, the protection of, of green belts around cities is, is critical for health reasons, um, encouraging infill development, smart growth development. Um, we've touched on, various speakers have talked about today. So that, that corollary green belt uh, protection has benefits for recreational purposes, for air quality, for water quality and water availability as that land can hold that water and filter it, as it um, before it moves into cities. So it, there are a number of reasons to do this from a health perspective, as well as food security and access to, to green space. Um, on the health benefits of, of the SWEET program, um, the main one probably would, is, to, uh, is to just to think about you know, access to water, especially in the Central Valley where there's a competition between agriculture and uh, uh, agricultural water use and um, urban water use. The third program is the Dairy Methane Reduction Program. Now this program is a little bit complicated and a little bit nascent. It's still taking form, but um, so far $12 million has been spent on anaerobic digesters on the a few of the largest concentrated animal feeding operations in the Central Valley to capture the methane and, and convert it to a biogas. 
Um, methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, um, so it's, a, it's what they call a short-lived climate pollutant. Um, there's another 50 billion, a million that's been allocated for this current budget year. It's going to be split for the first time between, those, uh, between anaerobic digesters and alternative manure management practices. And the latter is where we have put a tremendous amount of energy because we want to see some of the state funding be allocated towards practices that have other benefits in addition to greenhouse gas emissions. These confined animal feeding operations in the valley especially are, um, are quite harmful for human health and, and environmental reasons. Um, have big impacts on air quality and water quality. Um, and so we're excited and have been one of the leading advocates for taking some of the $50 million and putting it towards alternative practices that compost the manure, um, that um, maybe even move cows more onto grass for more of the year, um, in part because of the tremendous um, public health benefits that we'll get from doing that. Then the last program that's also very new and I can't say too much about just yet because it's still being designed, it should be rolled out in the next few months, is the Healthy Soils Initiative. And this is another very unique approach to, to greenhouse gas reductions and it addresses a very powerful um, uh, benefit of, of focusing on agriculture, which is that agriculture can be a sink for carbon. Really the only places that carbon can go is into the atmosphere where we don't want it, into the oceans where we also don't want it, or into forests and, and working lands and agricultural lands where we do want it because it's a building block of life and it's a key component of, of, of crop fertility. So this program is endeavoring to, again, provide grants to farmers for them to do practices on their farm that will, put, that will improve soil health and store more carbon in the soil and in woody plants on the, on the farm. Um, hedgerows around farm boundaries or, um, or driveways or um, around you know, buildings, those store carbon and have other soil benefits. They create biodiversity, they create pollinator habitat, uh, require less, uh, the use, less um, um, pesticides on farms if you have those pollinators there and those natural predators on farm. They also provide wildlife corridors for, the, for, for creatures that need to uh, move across farm landscapes. Um, there are other things this, this program is probably going to fund like uh, cover cropping and compost addition to soil and mulch. These are all practices that build more carbon in soil, improve yields, um, get us away from uh, dependence on synthetic nitrogen fertilizer which creates some of those problems I mentioned earlier around nitrate contamination and, and air quality issues. Um, and ultimately um, result in farm systems that are more resilient, that are less dependent on fossil fuel inputs, that have greater biodiversity with which to buffer against these impacts of climate change uh, and so on. So. Um, Th th those four programs, uh, to my knowledge, are unique in the country. Um, there are some federal programs funded under the Farm Bill that do some of, that touch on some of those that provide conservation payments to farmers for improved environmental stewardship. But there's nowhere that I'm aware of, um, very few places even in the world, where the, where farmers are getting payments to provide climate benefits through transitioning to to climate smart um, practices. The other key piece of the California story um, is on uh, the, it, the state's attempt to address environmental justice issues and equity issues. There are um, three, two, two bills really to talk about, SB 535, which passed several years ago that requires that of those greenhouse gas reduction funds, that $3 billion that's been sent, spent to date, 25% must be uh, allocated to communities that, that are term disadvantage and there's a definition of how the state decides who those are, who those people are. 25% of that money has to benefit disadvantaged communities. Um, and this is to address in part the um, uh, economic burden of, of as we make a transition to clean ener a clean energy economy, that disproportionate burden that poorer communities uh, face. And also to address, to attempt to address the fact that those communities are also located in the places where the biggest pollutants um, are uh, being, uh, being produced. AB 197 took that a step further, just passed in August, and it will require um, that the state do a better job of, of, of linking its greenhouse gas reductions efforts with, its, um, with the actual air quality problems that some of those same um, 
uh, big industries create and how that actually plays out um, is, is an experiment in progress and um, we're, we have quite a bit more work to do, I would say, on that. The future of cap and trade itself is in question. The program sunsets in the year 2020. Um, there's a court case pending right now um, between the oil lobby and, and the state about whether this is even a, a legal program to be able to spend this funding. Um, and the, 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 there's, there's a bill or two or three, we'll probably see this legislative year um, that will attempt to extend it past 2020. Um, so I'm happy to answer more questions now or by email later. I'm going to have to leave soon after this session, but I, I would be happy to work more closely with the public health community. I think there's quite a bit of um, benefit mutually to, to doing that. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.